Hello, and thank you for your patience. I have been gone because I suffered an injury on my right arm, and it's taking a couple months to heal. So I'm back with gouache here. This is actually a painting from before my arm was injured. And as you can see, I'm starting with a paper. This is the Etcher Lab Perfect Sketchbook. And it has been primed, as you can see, with acryl gouache. So I'm using an acryl gouache wash in the background of, of uh, I think it's called bright red or bright orange. It's a little bit brighter than burnt sienna. Those ones were coming out a little dark. And the reason I use acryl gouache is so that it doesn't pull up as I paint. I don't want it to interact or counteract with the gouache that I'm going to use on top. So first you'll see I am just casually laying out my uh, painting. I am doing a beautiful painting of Dana Point Cliffs. There's free parking near this area and you just walk down past the um, place and you'll be at these beautiful cliffs. It's very nice. And as you can see, I've got my spray bottle and my gouache palette. But I used the mixing palette on the left. You can see it's already got a lot of colors in it. And you'll notice when I start that I'm going to actually dip into those colors, use them to gray down and tone down my colors in the first place. And I've tried to show as much of it on the palette as I can. Um, but I'm going to go ahead and start with some of those lighter pastel you can see I dipped into my one of my favorite light pastel blues, which is from Daniel Smith's new line of gouache. It's called Lavender. And I use it in a lot of the skies, especially in overcast skies in California, because they tend to have a little bit of a muted blue gray color to them with s a little bit warmer than your typical bright blue sky. So here I am starting to block in my lights. And the reason that even though I use very little gouache, it shows up because there's already paint in my sponge. These sponges do get mold, especially if you have a moldy gouache. So I had a couple where the gouache itself kind of was prone to mold. So what I do is I keep the tin, or now I also have a little plastic thing. I keep them in the freezer when I'm not using them for more than a few hours so if I get a chance to paint more than one in one day I'll usually keep it out all day and I'll put it in the freezer at nighttime and that helps stop the mold but eventually you will smell the mold and you'll want to toss that sponge out give it a good alcohol or peroxide bath uh, and go from there so I'm using really bright colors but this is an overcast scene so it's not going to be quite so crazy and I don't think as much about edges as I probably should, but I'm mostly concerned about getting paint down because you can always work on all those little things later. I'm sticking near the sky color. The farther you are away from you, and especially with highly reflective overcast days on the ocean, the farther away, it's going to look closer to the sky. So I actually just took that sky color and added a little bit of color. And now you can see I'm making it darker and darker. I added turquoise and purple, I believe. Uh, and I'm just going to keep working as I go. In our beaches, we have very minimal greens, but they usually show up closer to the, kind of closer to the sand. Most of our waters themselves on overcast days tend to be like a slate or like a slate purple turquoise color. Not so vibrant. And so you can really take that sky color and just work your way into it. And you can see I added a little more green now. I'm closer to that sand area. That is because you can see through the water a little bit more on those areas. And so it looks a little bit more like a turquoise color. And you'll see I'm holding my brush um, across, so I'm holding it basically horizontal with my handle is vertical and the brush itself is horizontal because I notice that helps get me some depth because I tend to go in layers so it looks like planes, the planes that get farther and closer. So if I change colors, 
Like I just add a little bit of color. Maybe it's purple, maybe it's green. Whatever I see there in the photo or I see there in my um, in-person reference, since most of my paintings are from life, this is uh, based on a uh, sketch that I had that I had done from life. So the colors are there, but only because I've already uh, seen what they look like in person. But you'll notice if I just do a subtle color change because I'm only doing it line by line, it kind of mixes in with the other colors and makes it look like transitions getting farther and closer to you. It's pretty cool of an effect and it only just happens by holding your brush like that. You don't really have to do as much thinking about changing planes. I'm using a one inch brush and this is the same brush I use on my tiny sketchbooks. So I have uh, another video today of a small little um, a small little ocean piece that's a copy of like a master copy. And that one is uh, use the same brush. So you'll see that uh, I'll upload that soon as well. Thank you, by the way, for your patience. I meant to upload. I have enough to upload once or twice a week. But my injury has really set me back. So, All right, I'm working in those darker areas. And the good thing about that I started with all the lights is that I use a gray sponge, but you can use any sponge you want. My gray sponge does tend to give me to go a little dark, though, because when it's wet, it gets a little darker. So that makes everything look brighter than it actually is. Since I started with my lights, I can just darken them, darken, dar darken, and darken. And then that way I don't go too dark because most of these ocean views, most of California is not very dark. And then you'll have a couple of dark highlights here and there. On a bright, sunny, vibrant day, you'll have a lot more of those like darks and shadows. But on a day like this where it's overcast, all the shadows are pretty subtle. And the ones I'm working on now, again, are farther away. So the fact that I've been working my way down from the sky color means that they are going to look farther away. Instead of just grabbing a new color, it's all dark. Then you're going to have this super dark mass and it's going to look like it's right up next to you because of the contrast. So the rule of atmosphere is as follows. This is the most important thing I'm going to tell you today. The farther away an item or object is, the closer it gets to the actual atmosphere, so the sky essentially. So that means that the things that are close to you are full saturation. Let's, let's take green, for example. So the one that's closest to you is going to be green. As it goes further and further away, it's going to get closer to the sky color, but first it desaturates the yellow. So green purple, blue is the basically front, mid, and back ground for greens. Green, purple, blue. For something like this, if this cliff was right up next to me, it would probably be a lot warmer because it would have less of the sky interference. It would probably be a lot darker. So I would probably use a, a burnt sienna and maybe an ultramarine or dioxazine. Then as it goes back, I'll add a little titanium white and violet. And then if we had a cliff even further in the background, I would use a pale blue. That's just a little bit darker than the sky. So the purples that you see, you'll see that a lot in um, landscape paintings. You'll see purples in the cliffs. You'll see purples in mountains. And some of that's because it's showing you that it's farther away and it's losing the yellow because the yellow is the first to go. And then it becomes into this blue. So I have this um, rule basically where I kind of work in the purples if it's if it's middle far away and then I work in the blues when it's even farther away. It's added a lot of help to think of it that way. When I used to just make everything look cooler and bluer and lighter, it really wasn't working because I, I just didn't get it. I could put it down and sometimes it would look right, but it didn't always look right. One of the things you want to do with painting is maybe erase some of your stuff because if it only looks right on accident, it means you don't really, really, really understand how you got it to look right. If you know how you got it to look right, you'll be able to repeat it indefinitely. And sometimes just doing it the second round makes it a little easier. You get your colors a little faster. You fix some of the drawing errors that you might have had. 
uh, and stuff like that. So I do recommend, if you can, you know, repeating your subject over and over, especially if you paint very quickly like I do. I'm a little bit lazy. I have a very short attention span. Uh, so I tend to paint really fast and just kind of go, 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 go. And the second time I paint, it might only be 30 minutes also, but that 30 minutes is with all that original information from the first 30 minutes. And here you can see I'm going to lighten up my sky just to give it a little more contrast with that ocean color since they're kind of fading into each other right now. Um, the sky is bright, right? Then you're going to have the reflection of the sky because the ocean is huge. There's always sky in your ocean. Uh, you're going to see that reflection, but that reflection is always going to be a little bit darker because the sky is the light source for that reflection. So I tend to lighten things up as I go. I'm not a huge uh, stickler about it. I don't mind grabbing some white paint and putting it on top. I don't even mind if it's like the right color. Sometimes I'll just put white straight up on top. And you'll notice I don't use a lot of water. I use more water than I guess I'm supposed to, but I don't use too much water when I paint in gouache. Everyone says you got to paint like you're a millionaire. I paint like I'm a hundred nair, like I have a hundred dollars and that hundred dollars has to last me <laughs> a month or two. <laughs> so it's not quite like a millionaire, but at least I do put a generous amount of paint on the, <laughs> on the thing. You know, what really helps is the wash in the background. Cause then you don't, you don't feel like you have to fill every little space. And I'm a thick painter, but only once I get to the very end where I'm putting like stuff on top, which you'll see here. And then one thing you'll, you'll notice that like my drawing was already laid out. I laid it out in the beginning. I just gave myself some guidelines. And so now I'm just looking at that reference, trying to find where the changes are. I like to work from top to bottom if I can. Um, but it, if it's not such a sky based uh painting i might work from the middle out so i did today i did two train paintings and it was mostly the train there's a lot of trees around the train so the, for the first one i actually started with the train for the second one i started with the trees behind the train it's all personal preference but you will start to feel by practicing what's best there's nothing that's gonna get you to where you want to be like practicing because even if you mess up you're going to know that you messed up and it's going to be easier for you the next round so you're going to go okay no wait I do want to put in the background first or oh I do want to do the train body first or whatever your subject is and you'll also notice how muted my colors are one of the reasons that I get these nice beautiful muted colors and so when I go in and pop it with these bright blues like you see here is because I have lots of paint on my palette already. I'll usually just go grab my paint and then stick it somewhere that has some of the colors I'm already looking for. So if I need some purples, they're already on the palette because I am cheap. I am only a hundred nair. So I do have to be conservative. And one of the great things about gouache is that if you keep it wet and you can throw it in the freezer again, I spray it with that little mister you see the mister is from Ranger Inc. Uh, it's a pack of like three of them, I think. It's a mister that's made for doing like alcohol ink type of work. And it's fantastic. It's just a very light, gentle spray. And if you keep it there, you can just indefinitely work into these piles. So if they change color, that's good because you'll use that gray to tone down your purple, let's say. Or you'll use that gray to make your tree darker. I took a quick break there. Now you can see a little more of my spot and my cute little feet. Yes, I'm wearing socks with sandals. That's how we roll in California. Thank you. <laughs> Actually, I recorded this one in my crystal shop. Uh, I have a crystal shop. Now I only have one in Buena Park, but I had a couple. This one was my Garden Grove location. But I, along with loving to paint, I love rocks. Like, Crystals, stones, rocks, you name it. I had a huge rock collection as a kid. I have an even bigger rock collection now. Uh, and so I have a crystal shop in Buena Park. It's called Lucky Eye, in case you're ever over there. The good thing is I get to paint at work. So here I am painting at work. And wearing comfortable shoes also. <laughs> 
I'm starting in on the details. So you'll notice, though, the whole time I did not change brushes until just now. Uh, and then there's only one other brush I'm going to use on this one because I was watching. Uh, and it's a newer thing because basically I was watching this guy who said he does gouache. Ooh, what's his name? He does these beautiful gouache landscapes. And um, he was basically saying that if you use oil painting type of brushes, you can get some oil painting type effects. Now, if you guys that don't know me, like if you're just here on YouTube, I've been doing oil painting for ages. I've been in galleries, blah, blah, blah. I only just started doing landscapes, period, about a year ago, a little over a year ago. And during the time I started landscapes, I started using gouache. Um, I'm an oil painter in my heart, okay? I love oil painting. Um, I also am going to do a series on water-soluble oils because I've been using those since I have a bird. And he is not, it's, you cannot have um, oil paint thinners around a bird. So I'll start doing a series about that later. But I started using gouache recently. I'm more of an oil painter. I'm used to more oil painting type of stuff. Uh, so you'll see that sometimes I go and I try to use semi-oil painting techniques. But anyway, later I'll show you this brush. It's a mop and it's a natural hair. So I don't use it that much because it sucks up a lot of water. But it works well for the foam type of edges. I do a little foam in this brush too, but it looks much better once I hit it with the mop brush. And all that's all new. These are all things you can learn just by watching other people um, paint, watching other people's type of thing. I just started taking a class with Mike Hernandez. Uh, he's on Instagram. I think his Instagram is squash, squash, gouache or something like this. But he's a phenomenal gouachist. And he had a flash course on brain brainstorm, I believe. And it was only like a couple hundred, maybe like a hundred and something dollars. So highly recommended because I've learned a lot. So my next, my next videos, I'll have even more information in them. <laughs> but like you, I'm always learning. You're always learning. And the only way we're going to learn, you and me, is just by practicing. Not practicing in a, oh, if I don't practice, I feel so bad. But practicing in a, I love the way it feels putting paint down and looking at those values and analyzing these shapes. And it is just such a joy. I'm going to go do it. And sometimes I paint um, big blocks of just one color. Boom. Just like a big orange block. And because all I want to do is put paint down and it's fun. Sometimes I paint from my head. So I'll paint some illustrations. Maybe usually I like to do like portraits. Portraits were my specialty in oil painting. I never did landscape before. This is all new to me. Um, you know, or maybe I'll start thinking about doing like a painting of my bird or something like this. But it'll be very casual. And the only reason I do it is because I like putting paint down. But every time I do, it helps because I'll learn, oh, okay, I want to start with the background next time. So I was having a good time. That's it. Sometimes you just paint to have a good time. Do not lose the feeling of I'm having a good time. This is why I'm painting. Don't paint things that you don't want to paint. Paint things that you want to understand and they're challenging, but don't paint if you are not into it. Unless you have like a class assignment, they make you do all that stuff. And uh, for about six months, I've been saying I'm not doing any no tan studies. I refuse. But now I've done no tan studies and I'm like, oh, I see. I should do no tan. They're not, they're very fun because they're super simplified you know no tan is a in case you're wondering what i'm talking about it's a black and white you just use black that's it i can um, i usually throw a mid-tone in there too but um that's because i like to you know get a little bit more value changes than just black and white and you simplify everything into those values that way you can check your composition and stuff so for this no tan study if i did a no tan it would just be the black cliff connected to the dark seaside you wouldn't even see anything else it would be no other information and it would show you how as one mass they take the composition and for example they lead your eye to the left and then down through the bottom and then back up to the left because of the way 
uh, that the ocean is composed. So no tan studies are actually a lot more fun than I thought they would be. But I put them off for a long time just because I didn't want to. And there's nothing wrong with that. If you don't want to do something and you're not in school and you don't have to do it as an assignment, don't do it. Just enjoy your life. Do something you do like. Don't have any pressure. Open up your sketchbook. And uh, if you can tell, I, I start my sketchbooks in the back and I work my way forward. That way I never have new sketchbook anxiety because I start at the back. Uh, so the beginning of all my sketchbooks look really nice because <laughs> it will be after a couple of, you know, a couple of months of painting that the, the last final painting is on there. So no pressure. Like, this should be no pressure for you. It should be just really fun. I've changed again. We're working now with another soft uh, brush. And what I'm doing is I'm cutting down some of the edges. So I know a lot of gouache artists use different techniques for edges. Um, I do them a little bit like you would an oil painting. Um, most of the time I put my oil painting edges down pat, but sometimes you get a hard edge and you take your soft brush, and in this case a tiny bit of water, which I'm constantly cleaning it, um, on, my, on my thing, and you just kind of knock it down because gouache will reactivate, so you can knock those edges down to your heart's delight. And my water's not even that clean, um, as you can see. And my brush is very soft. This is also a natural hairbrush. I don't use this for painting. I only use it for edges. You can see me working my way there. But I have no problem if something gets a little bit knocked down because I can always repaint it. Oh, yeah, let's take the tape off. And now you can see because of my sponge, how dark everything is, but relative is all that matters. So you see how relative the values look. They look great. And there we are. Thank you again for joining me. I hope to have another video up this week um, as I've started to use my arm again. And thanks for your patience. I can't wait to talk more about gouache and water-soluble oils coming up soon, too. Talk to you soon.